Hello, everybody. Welcome to this evening's Practice Development Educational Series sponsored by the ABB Optical Group. My name is Craig Norman, and I want to welcome to you to this evening's event where I think you're going to have a very, very interesting uh, lecture by one of the premier scleral lens experts in the U.S. So here's our speaker for this evening. Dr. Maria Walker, as I said, uh, has become one of the real premier scleral lens experts. Uh, I feel very fortunate that I've known Dr. Walker since she was just a pup in the contact lens field as a resident at uh, Pacific University and have really watched with admiration her career path uh, as she is really doing some very wonderful things. Uh, she's presently at the University of Houston in the College of Optometry where she's working on her PhD. Uh, along with other activities there on the uh, teaching and the research end. Uh, she's a, a current board member of the Scleral Lens Education Society and has received other awards uh, also uh, throughout her career, even though it is just getting started. Dr. Maria Walker, welcome. What a pleasure to be able to have you here this evening. Can you please educate us a bit on scleral lens design and fitting, taking us through the basics of this interesting subject? Sure. Thank you so much, Craig. Uh, such an honor to be uh, starting off this this series. So we'll we'll get right into it. So this is um, a pretty basic lecture. So it's the basics of scleral lenses. So we'll go over everything from how we term certain aspects and design and then how we fit. Uh, and we will touch on, on how we actually manage, manage these lenses and these patients throughout. So most of us probably are familiar with what a scleral lens is, but here you can see the probably one of the more famous animations. And essentially the scleral lens is intended to vault over the cornea. You can see this is a, an ectatic cornea. So these are irregular, fit on irregular eyes. Um, so you get this nice fluid bath for the cornea and then landing on the conjunctiva overlying the sclera. So there is some terminology that I do want to review, and some of this is the same as with other types of lenses, and some of it is, is rather unique. And so for the overall diameter, again, we're, we're all familiar with that. That's the, the longest diameter of the lens. And the base curve, which you can see all the colors here uh, match the the picture here. And this is just a picture of a scleral lens basically sitting on a tabletop. Um, and you'll see this picture a couple of times and, and you can sort of see where some of the junctions are in this particular lens. Um, so, so it's kind of nice. Now the feature that is unique to a scleral lens specifically when we talk terminology is the sagittal depth, uh, which is the height of the lens from, from the base to the apex as you see there. And that's really important because because that's the underlying principle of how we fit the scleral lens. We essentially are fitting the sag or the sagittal depth of the lens to, to the sag of, of the eye itself. Now, what is the relationship of this sag to diameter and to base curve? Well, essentially, um, you can see by these diagrams here, if you have a smaller diameter lens. So say you have a lens that's 14.5, that's a small lens. Well, you're gonna have a sagittal depth that's going to be a little smaller if you're fitting a, you know, if you're comparing it to a larger lens on that same eye. Now with base curve, you can think a steeper base curve, and this goes for any lens, is gonna be associated with, with a deeper sagittal sagittal depth. Now, in terms of the actual zones, and these are the, the most recent terminologies that have been adopted by the ISO and endorsed by the Scleral Lens Education Society. So these are the four zones that we use. And when you're, when you're fitting specific scleral lenses, uh, they'll often have their own proprietary names for each of these zones, but this is the global all-encompassing uh, zones that, that go for every lens. So optic zone, of course, central, this is where the optics of, of the lens are going to be. Um, what's a little bit more new for, for this lens is we have these transition zones, and again, you can see the color matching down here. Uh, transition zone, which is essentially between that optic zone and the inter intermediate zone. Now this area here, this intermediate zone and transition zone, 
collectively are going to be overlying that limbal area. So I'll try to keep my terminology straight, but if you hear me saying limbal area, I'm referring to a combination of that transition and intermediate zone. And then of course the landing zone is where, where the lens lands on the eye. So if we look at a cross section, and this is a kind of stitched together OCT image, you can see uh, the cornea into, into the sclera and that optic zone transitioning into that intermediate zone. So transition zone and intermediate zone, as you can see here, are, are collectively overlying that limbus. So when you actually fit lenses, they're gonna separate them into usually three to four zones. So they'll either have a central, mid peripheral, another mid peripheral and a landing, or they'll kind of combine these two areas into some sort of limbal zone. So there are over 20 scleral lens designs available in the United States. Um, again, it's, it's pretty analogous from lens to lens, but there will be different names that are proprietary. But in that optic zone, that's where we have um, the base curve. We're going to put um, either toric. We can even put multifocal. Some really customized designs now are allowing us for, to have wavefront guided, but for the most part, it's toric and multifocal. Uh, base curve, I say base curve can be used to manipulate lens thickness because I would say that that's probably the most that I think about the base curve. If I have a lens that's very thick uh, because it's a high plus lens and I want it to be thinner, then I'm going to manipulate that base curve and use my SAMFAP uh, to, make, to make a thinner lens and, and change the power. So that's really the main reason why I even think about base curve. Uh, we more think of these lenses in terms of sag. And then landings or limbal zones, we've got, um, that's probably the simplest zone. We just go steeper or flatter if we want to get further away or closer to that part of the cornea. Um, and then the landing zone, which is, is probably the most complex and the most customizable nowadays, uh, where you can do toric, even quadrant specific, um, and even more customized from there, which, which we'll mention uh, again towards the end. Now, in terms of in your office, what, what would I recommend? Well, I would say choose a few designs and become an expert. There's no reason that you need to have all 20 of these fitting sets in the office. Um, I try to use two or three different diameters, so a small diameter and a large diameter maybe. Um, I tend to fit larger diameters on ocular surface disease patients who need that full coverage because of uh, their exposure, exposure disease. Um, versus a keratoconus patient who may who may be able to be fit with with a relatively smaller diameter lens, um, but as you fit, you may develop a preference for one or the other. There's there's pros and cons. I would say I at least have one design that has a multifocal option. Uh, especially if you have at all an aging population. We know we fit these people and everything's great. And then you realize, oh, that person with keratoconus is also 47 years old. Uh, and as soon as we make things good for the distance, then they, they want uh, they want more and more. They want good vision in all distances. So uh, it's nice to be able to transition people into a multifocal design if if applicable. And then I say at least one with a customizable landing zone. So at least one that has, um, I would say a quadrant specific for, for your patients who have um, irregularities, which are going to be a lot of them, uh, asymmetries or true irregularities in their, in their conjunctiva overlying the sclera, which can make them uh, really tricky to fit. So who are we fitting? Uh, again, this is probably a review for most of us. We know that this is a primarily specialty market, so irregular astigmatism. Uh, about 50% of patients in the U.S. fitted into scleral lenses are done so for keratoconus, um, but certainly here in Houston, we see a lot of post-RK. Um, depending on where you are, you may or may not see more or less of some of these conditions. Um, ocular surface protection is that other main indication. And this is, um, in, in my opinion, we really, really change 
uh, people's day-to-day -day functionality with, with um, this ocular surface protection. You can see this picture here. This is actually this bottom right picture is a patient of mine who had a cancer in one of her cheekbones and had a surgery that created some deformities. And that was as much as her eyes could close naturally. So you can imagine the discomfort that these patients are in. She was sleeping with a rock over her eye and basically holding that eye shut walking around um, versus we put a scleral lens on and boom she's functional so really can make a big difference in all of these people's people's lives so how do we actually fit these things well the first thing to consider is what's what's our exam sequence going to look like so we start off with our baseline slash fitting exams and then bring them back for a dispense and then and then follow up with them just like we would with any other specialty lens uh, but there are of course some unique uh, things that we need to be to be considering so I always harp on this a bit because I, you know, not as much now, but when I was first starting out, I got burned a little bit by this because you don't have a really good evaluation of your current disease state at the time of fitting. You can really stress yourself out not knowing whether or not you you caused something or or it was already there. So these three pictures are pictures of three of my patients before they were fit into a scleral lens. So you can see how the neovascularization in this bottom left-hand image of an RK incision would trouble me, especially if I had caused it from, from the scleral lens. Um, this type of staining in an SJS patient, right? Is it before or after I put a lens on it? Very important to know. Uh, same with the scarring here. Was the lens touching apically and causing that, or was that just normal keratoconus scarring? So very important to monitor um, disease state of the cornea and disease state of the uh, conjunctiva, the meibomian glands, lids, if patients have special situations like uh, glaucoma, cataracts, things like that. Um, you want to not only document what they have, but I also like to have a conversation with the patient. So if this guy right here in the bottom left came in and was being fit, um, I'd really want to do a lot to kind of pre-treat that meibomian gland dysfunction and blepharitis so that I maximize the success with a scleral lens. Again, things that we should be doing with all contact lenses, um, but, but it just improves the outcome of success if you can get the eyes as healthy as possible prior to fitting. So once you've evaluated where you're where you're starting and what your baseline information is, we can do the diagnostic fitting. Biggest question I usually get about this is what equipment do I need? Um, and the the answer is the only one that you absolutely need is this one in the middle here, our slit lamp. OCT can be very helpful. It's very nice for sharing with your consultants or your colleagues what what you're looking at but it's it's not essential uh, this is the pentacam over here on the left i would say that is almost essential you really need to have and anybody who's doing any specialty contact lenses you, you need to have a topographer of some sort. I don't think I need to convince you of that. Um, but I really like the Pentacam specifically for scleral lenses because it allows us to measure corneal thickness. Um, and I will touch in on this when I talk about management, um, but you know, this is a, a basic lecture, so I won't go too much into it. Uh, but we do worry a little bit about, or a lot, depending on the patient, about corneal edema with these lenses because it's such a thick system and oxygen has to traverse so far to get to the cornea. Um, so it's something that I like to have so that if I do suspect edema, I can monitor it appropriately. But ultimately, uh, what we'll see today is you can evaluate everything you need to evaluate about the fit uh, with with just using your scleral lens. So step one is to apply the lens. And one thing that I always do from, from the start to the finish is involve the patient in every part of it. So when I'm applying their first diagnostic lens, I'm keeping them uh, engaged, talking to them about it. You'll save yourself a lot of time, whether or not it's you or your technicians doing it, uh, a lot of time will be saved if you are explaining to the patient what you're doing before 
uh, they're going to do it. So applying the lens, eyes wide open, uh, we tilt up head parallel to the ground. You can see um, this woman here has a mirror so that she can look at herself. Patients sometimes need it, sometimes don't. Uh, and then the lens is gonna be raised on a level plane here and put onto the eye. And I always have patients close their eyes over the plunger uh, just helps to ensure that it kind of brings that lens up onto the eye. Now, it's important to clarify to patients to have the, the lens full of saline or, or whatever your application solution that you're using is. Um, overfill that lens and apply it on a, on a level plane. Otherwise, you will get an application bubble. So here's an example of an application bubble you can see. Um, that's because the fluid of course spills out during application and that is both uncomfortable for the patient bad for the health of the eye uh, and they're also going to have trouble seeing through that so those lenses have to be uh, removed and reapplied now when you're teaching patients about this keep in mind uh, their visual status right so if you look at these two pictures here just kind of to yourself, which one do you think is more is easier for the patient to look at and actually establish a target? So it always amazes me how many of those navy blue plungers we see because really I think the, the lighter colored plungers make it easier. Uh, the patients can see that central target, which is that black hole. Now, if patients are still having trouble with all of the education that you give them, you can go a step further um, and I recommend getting one of these for your office or two of them for your office. Um, it's called the Sea Green Lens Inserter. Uh, you can see it's a stand here and there's actually an LED light that kind of connects through, uh, which you can see here. So again, patients who have dexterity issues, things like Parkinson's disease, if they have really poor visual status, so really severe keratoconus, really jacked up transplants, right? They're gonna have trouble seeing the target. So these are tools that you can use. Um, the the uh, other thing that you can do is actually use a like a styrofoam cup. You of course don't have the LED light that swings through, but that's kind of the back home way of, of uh, getting a stand for your patients. So when we fill the lens for the diagnostic fitting, we use sodium fluorescein to uh, assess that tear foam reservoir. So we put our fluorescein in, in the bowl of the lens. We use preservative-free saline as the application solution in almost all circumstances. Um, and I say that, and it's kind of a loaded um, statement because we, we more and more are using off-label um, application solutions that are also preservative free. Again, that's out of the scope of what we're talking about here. Um, but if you become more advanced at this, there are preservative free artificial tears, things that we're doing off label, of course. Um, so you have to be careful and decide if, if that works for your patient population. Um, but it, it, you, you do hear people using that. Now, preservative free is the key here. And if you don't have preservative free, you'll get a cornea that looks like this in about 10 minutes or so. Uh, we had a, some students in our clinic actually were using, we have eye wash and for irrigation in all of our uh, clinic lanes. And they were using this thinking, oh, it's just, you know, basically saline. Uh, and this is what, this is one of the students who put a scleral lens in and said, oh, things are a little bit blurry after a few minutes. And that's what it looks like. So some of these preservatives will, will eat eat up a, an epithelium pretty quickly. So make sure patients understand to use preservative, preservative free. So before we talk about evaluation, I'll just quickly talk about removal because we won't mention it anywhere else. Um, and it's an important piece of the education that you're gonna give to, to patients. So removal of a scleral lens, the keys to remember uh, first of all, we're going to use this smaller plunger here that's able to establish suction. The larger plunger has a hole in it, so it's it's harder to get to get suction. You can see this is on the periphery of the lens, periphery of the lens, right on that lens edge, and you basically gently um, put the plunger on the lens and and remove it that way. Now, I don't have any of those the videos because we don't we don't we gender, generally don't do uh, videos and webinars in case they freeze on you. But um, if you go to the Scleral Lens Education Society website, 
we have several videos of application and removal of lenses on a patient and on uh, yourself. So go watch these yourselves, direct your technicians to watch these, direct your patients to watch these. So now let's talk about the actual evaluation of the scleral lens once it's on the eye. So here is an image of a scleral lens. Bowl is full of fluorescein and the lens, and it looks nice on the eye there. And as a reminder, we're going to look at our four different zones. And really, we're looking at three different zones. But keeping in mind, with some of our more advanced designs, we may be able to manipulate four different zones. Uh, so it's nice to delineate and, and do some customization there if you so please. Now, what are our rules kind of for fitting each of these different zones? Well, we've got that optic central zone, vault, transition zone, vault. So those are the zones overlying the cornea, always vault those. Um, the intermediate zone, I say align. Uh, we do want to clear that. I don't like to use the word vault, though, because it implies that you want to get really far away from that limbus. And you really don't want to get more than 10 or 15 microns in an ideal fit. Um, and we'll talk about some of the, the issues that you can have if you over vault um, both the limbus and even, even that cornea. We're, we're vaulting, but not by too much. And then in the landing zone, we want a soft and an even landing. So once we've got fluorescein in, and this is a patient who has uh, fluorescein in the lens, and we're using the cobalt blue full illumination. So it's nice. You can either do this in the slit lamp, or a lot of us have little keychains where we can just shine a cobalt blue filter or a cobalt blue light on the eye. Um, essentially, what you want to see here on a quick glance is no areas of, of extreme darkness. You can see there's a little shadow. If you can see my mouse right there, uh, that's just from a shadow. That's not uh, something to be uh, concerned about. So we say, okay, it looks, it looks pretty good. Uh, and then we actually are gonna switch to white light for a more um, complete uh, evaluation, a more, a more exact, precise measurement of exactly how much uh, we're clearing that central cornea. So when I'm evaluating the lens, as I start from the center and work my way out. So we start in the central area. So we do white light. We do our, use our optic section, and it's about a 45 degree angle. So I always tell students it's exactly like measuring the von Herrick angle, uh, and you're comparing ratios of of your optic section to determine the thickness. And so you can see in this inset here, this is a contact lens here, about 350 microns thick. Most of our fitting sets will specify how thick the lens is. Certainly the actual lenses, once you get them, will have a CT value on them, which is the center thickness value. Um, but if not, you can ask your rep, talk to your consultants, figure out what the thickness is. Um, <coughs> excuse me. We try to stay away from measuring it against the cornea because our corneas and our irregular corneas are so variable in their thickness. So in this example, got about a one to one ratio indicating that the tear thickness, and this one was measured to be uh, 300 microns thick. Now when you're first starting out, it can be nice to have a scale. And so Ferris State, and actually Craig uh, was one of the people that worked on this, has this fitting scale. So if you don't have an OCT, um, and you want to, you know, kind of test yourself or test your technicians, uh, you can use this scale. And it actually has a scale for all the different fitting fitting um, components, the limbal area, the, the landing zone. So I suggest you get some of these for your office and you can get them. If you contact Ferris State, they can, uh, they can help you get those. So looking again at our optic transition zone, so what numbers do we want? And there's a lot of numbers on here. So let's kind of go through them. So final clearance, we want about 100 to 200 microns over the, the highest corneal elevation. Now, keeping in mind that these lenses are not going to stay exactly how they are when we first apply them. So they're going to start out maybe 250 to 300 microns. We expect about 150 microns of settling. And that's a lot of people have done a lot of work figuring out how, how much that is. And it's about 150 microns. 
Now, keep in mind, we talk about this 100, 200, 300 microns, but if you have an irregular cornea, which we so often do, and like this image here shows us, you're going to have pretty extreme variations in corneal height. So you may have the area, the apex of this cone here, where you have 125 microns, and then the deeper areas like here, where you have more like 400, even 500 microns of clearance. So we don't expect a uniform tear reservoir. And what we do is we clear as little as we can, but making sure that we're clearing. So I say you could even go down to maybe 50 or 75 microns in this apical area, but you really want to make sure that that's never getting down to, to touch at any point. Keeping in mind some days it may sink a little bit more than, an, than the other. So I like to shoot for around 100 microns of clearance over that apex, and then I hope not to really drown out the rest of, of the cornea. And you can see here, if you have clearance that's too much, not only do we worry about oxygen getting through this lens and through this tear film, probably even more so we worry about these little guys here, all this little debris that can get underneath that lens. And the denser that debris gets, the more visually significant it can become. The other thing that we have to consider is that patients are blinking over this. So if you have a lens that's got so much depth that the patient has to basically blink over this little mini mountain, or the eyelid rather has to blink over this mini mountain, it can be very uncomfortable for the patient um, and it can apply pressure onto the sclera, undue pressure onto the sclera. Now shown another way, this is an ectasia pattern, and maybe just look at the left image, it looks like it's a little bit more uh, easy to appreciate, that here in this apical area, if we consider how it, how it is a ratio to the lens, we may have about 100 microns in that, in that apical area, and you can see it's gonna be deeper in other areas. So this is a well-fitted lens on an ectatic eye. And if you do have an area where the lens is touching, the issue becomes apical staining. And so you will get breakdown due to bearing of the lens in that area, uh, which of course can lead to not only discomfort, um, but it can lead to scarring, which we, we obviously want to avoid. So we wanna vault over the cornea by about 100 microns at that apex and hoping we don't vault too, too much in, in the other areas. Uh, now, before we go on to the limbal and landing zone areas, we'll pause here and I'll give uh, a chance if there's any questions, we can go through them. Okay, great. Thank you, Maria. Uh, first of all, let me apologize to the audience that I failed to point out that there is a questions box in your dashboard where you can type in questions to uh, ask of tonight's speaker. Luckily, there are veteran webinar goers uh, that are attending tonight because we do have a number of questions anyways that have been presented to us. We just wanna go through a couple of these, um, Maria, and then we will also be touching on more questions at the end of tonight's presentation. So the first one relates to uh, the area that you just discussed, and this is this vaulting area. And uh, the question is, um, are you worried about the amount of oxygen that gets through an area where there's larger vaulting underneath the lens? Um, yes and no. Um, yes, because intuitively you have a larger distance. No, because we the more we learn about this, actually, there was a study that just came out from Berkeley, um, and they actually did not find much of a, or any correlation between the, the thickness of the tear reservoir within reason. I think they looked at 200 and 400 microns. Um, and the and the reason that we think that is is because once the tears and if anybody's put fluorescein over the top of the lens, they'll see the tears mix once they're in that zone. So it's really you know the whole cornea is is, is theoretically getting the same amount of oxygen because of that tear mixing and it and it creates an exponential amount of oxygen. Um, it, it's a loaded question that I won't go too much more into, but the, but I'll just leave it as. My transplant patients are the ones who I really watch this on. The other ones don't seem to have an issue. 
Okay, that's actually an excellent response because it might be coming from there are theoretical models of what happens underneath the lens and now the work done in Berkeley is showing that clinically it might be a little bit different. Um, so uh, here's a real practical one. What kind of advice do you have for a patient if they lose their removal plunger? Uh, well, you know, I have a lot of patients who actually don't use the removal plunger. Um, I recommend that they use it just so that they don't, you know, pinch their eye or, or get uncomfortable. But you can, just like when you're removing a corneal GP lens, use your eyelids. So some patients, I will actually have them practice with their eyelids. So if you can get your eyelids wide enough open, and what I usually recommend is they look up. And then you use your lower lid to push again, push the lid against the eye and like pop it and then kind of let the lens fall. That's how we take them out of babies <laughs> um, is you just have them look up a little. You push there. It's going to be a little more uncomfortable because you're probably going to get an air bubble under there. But the lens will come out. Um, I recommend they try to do that rather than leave it in and sleep with the lens or anything like that. It might not be the most comfortable, but it will it will get that lens out. Okay, great. And then just one more before we continue, and we will also have questions uh, at the end of our presentation, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, and this one is also a practical one and uh, for the basic content of this evening, and that, that is, are there any contraindications for scleral lenses? Yeah, and again, that's a loaded question um, and, and one that I have had many long conversations about. I am on the more conservative side, so I think that there are lots of relative contraindications. Um, a good example is one that we actually saw earlier. So somebody who has a, a bleb or any sort of glaucoma shunt, um, the more that we're learning about potential effect on IOP that these lenses might have, it's not a contraindication for the average, even the average keratoconus or diseased population, but people who are really have severe glaucoma, which they would if they were having a, a some sort of Sec anterior segment surgery, um, I don't take the risk with them. Put them in a piggyback, put them in something else. Um, uh, and then that's probably my biggest. And then the other ones are those transplant patients who have really low endo counts. Um, <clears throat> I'll usually still fit them, but really watch them. Uh, and some of them are not necessarily a full contraindication, but maybe we're on a wear cycle of just a couple hours a day, and then they remove the lens for a bit. Um, it's inconvenient, but when the alternative is nothing, it's, you know, you work with the, the disease. So those are the two, endothelial disease from transplant or otherwise, and glaucoma are the biggies. I may think of another one, and I'll I'll uh, I'll point it out, but it's, okay. um, it, yeah. Okay, that, that was great. So if you would continue, please. All right. We'll get through these. Okay, moving towards the limbus. So again, we're in that transition intermediate zone. Some of our lenses have a nice little peripheral area there. You can adjust. Some of them just lump all this together. Um, here we're in that mid peripheral area, and now we can see uh, out towards the limbus. So here again, we can evaluate this when we're doing our, you know, we can start evaluating this when we're doing our center out approach like we, we started with. Um, when we're looking with full illumination cobalt blue, um, you'll see dark areas. You don't see any dark areas here on either of these images. These are both well-fitted uh, limbus intermediate transition, whatever you want to call it, zones. Um, if you see here on this right image, there's a nice fluorescent. As long as you can see even a sliver, like this might even be more than the patient needs for clearance in that area. Um, if you see even a sliver of fluorescein, you're, you're clearing enough in that limbal area. Here's an OCT image shows you. Once you get so that it's touching, like you see in this bottom area, um, it's going to look very dark in that fluorescein pattern. So um, if you do have an OCT, it can be nice to, to measure this sort of thing. Uh, not essential. Um, you don't want to overvault the limbus, though. Again, just like with the apical clearance, the more clearance you have in this area here between the limbus and the lens, the more of a channel you can get for, for debris to come underneath that lens and, and cause visual uh, or inflammatory re responses. 
The other thing is you don't want the landing zone here to be pushing too severely in. And the more you clear here, you lessen the width of the landing zone here, which increases the pressure. We call it the high heel effect. So limbus, clear it, but, but not by too much. Here's an Im image of a, a big no-no here, a full bearing circle here uh, in the periphery. And you can see you take that lens off uh, and like you'd expect to get epithelial breakdown there. People have time and time again shown that the limbus will, uh, that epithelium overlying the limbus will respond and, and become inflamed if it's interacting with, with the lens. So let's move right along into the, the scleral landing zone. Uh, again, this is here we show a nice landing zone. You don't see any interruption of blood vessels, no redness either under the lens or adjacent to the lens. Beautiful landing zone there. If we look on our OCT, I like this OCT because it shows, again, what you want, the goal is to have as long of a landing zone as possible. Uh, and you can see this really nicely transitions and there's no big junctions here that are going to cause pressure points on on the conjunctiva that are going to bother a patient now this red line here is, is here because people always look at these and an untrained eye will say oh well it looks like it's impinging well it is going to compress the conjunctiva just by virtue of being a lens that's suctioned onto the eye and landing on a soft tissue but our, our general rule, and I, I got this from Tom Arnold, actually, and I've, I've been using it, and it works pretty well. If you can draw a line that bisects that lens edge, and it doesn't point into the conjunctiva like so, and it just kind of goes along tangentially with the conjunctiva, you're usually in pretty good shape. But admittedly, I think you're going to get more out of your slit lamp in terms of evaluating this landing zone uh, than, the, than the OCT, truly. So you can see here's an example on the left of blanching where you just kind of have a little bit of whitening, uh, but you don't see any major interruption of blood vessels <clears throat> versus impingement on this right side where you do see that, that blood vessel being uh, rather significantly impinged. Now here's an extreme example, um, and this looks like a pretty hot eye in general, but it's definitely got a, uh, a landing zone that's, that's too steep. So this would be, a flat. And I haven't really been mentioning it, but it's nice with the scleral lenses. Once you get the hang of it, it's pretty simple. If you're too close, go a little, you know, get the lens further away. If you're too far away, get closer. So with this, if you're too tight, if you're blanching, you need to flatten the lens in those areas uh, versus if you have too much edge lift uh, and you can use your um, slit lamp. So if you bring the slit lamp, you can imagine Here's my shadow. My slit, lamp, my slit lamp beam is coming in from this direction. So it's 180 degrees away from, from that edge. And you can see if it will cast a shadow, which can indicate that you have too much edge lift. <coughs> like, with other, excuse me, like with other patients, with other lenses, patients will feel this. Um, and you can see this OCT image shows uh, a lens that has too much edge lift. And also here, that's going to give them, uh, like I was saying, with that high heel effect, you want to uh, you want to steepen this a little bit to get it more smooth into there. Now it's different with every lens how many steps you steepen, exactly what you're going to change with the lenses. So if you go away from this with just the general principles of what it looks like when it's steep or flat. Um, or bearing or, or, or lifting too much. And then you bring that information to your consultant with, with whatever lens you're fitting. Um, then, then you'll be in good shape and, and they can help you, uh, especially in the beginning, determine exactly which changes to make. Um, and each lens has different, you know, one step flat might mean 30 microns flat, might mean 50 with another lens. So again, there's no real universal change metric. So uh, you can just work design by design, design by design rather. You will get some uneven scleral bearing in a lot of patients. Um, again, kind of out of the scope of this basic lecture, but I just wanted to uh, touch on on some of the more advanced technology available. Um, so this is an example of what we call a scleral elevation map here, this topography image in the bottom right corner. That's showing us 
the elevation of the sclera. And so blue areas indicate that the sclera is relatively depressed versus the red or white areas, it's relatively elevated. So if you were to put, as we did, a, a toric lens, and you can see this black toric marker on this, on this lens, that's gonna denote, usually it denotes the flat meridian, but again, different lens designs may mean different, different uh, standards. So uh, it's oftentimes the flat, sometimes it's the steep. In this case, it's obviously gonna be marking that flat meridian here at the 90, which is going to uh, line up very nicely with the, the flatter or the higher elevation of, of the sclera. So again, you've got toric, we can even go to quadrant specific in many designs, but, but that gets pretty sophisticated. So if you remember the summary of the fitting goals, essentially we want one to 200 microns after that 150 settling, settling feature. Uh, in that intermediate zone, we're aligning, so maybe five to 10 microns of clearance, and then landing soft and widely on, on the conjunctiva. I didn't mention it yet, but I'll mention it here, minimal movement on these lenses. Uh, sometimes people will say, well, it's, it's moving, so that's good. Well, if it's moving, most likely the patients are gonna be pretty uncomfortable. Um, some patients have lenses that move and, and tears exchange readily, and somehow they don't get debris under there and they're comfortable but that is the exception not the rule for the most part these lenses uh, you don't want them to be so tight that you can't push them a little bit if you play if you use the lid to push the lens um, but you you really don't want to see them really moving around on the eye so once you have an adequate fit um, i don't think you guys have this slide but we'll send them to you at the follow-up um, you're gonna do your over refraction. Now, I like to start with retinoscopy. It's kind of old school. If you wanna do auto refraction, it's fine. I like retinoscopy because it allows you to see if the lens is wetting properly and just what the, the reflex looks like. You can get a lot of information. Um, I do a sphero sill over refraction. Um, different people like to use the four opter versus loose lens. Um, it depends on my patient. If I have a really big over refraction, oftentimes I'll use loose lenses. And certainly if I have something with a high amount of sill, um, which we can get some residual sill in probably 30 to 50% of these patients, um, then it can be nice for fine tuning the axis because if you have a trial lens, they can manipulate the axis on their own. <clears throat> the tips I would I would say are, are, the, are the best to remember. Um, less than 75 diopters of sill, just use a spherical equivalent. Um, I don't, I, especially to start, um, patients will sometimes have some kind of interesting visual phenomenon when they first put a lens on, you know, they're looking through a thick tear reservoir and a thick lens. Um, so the, the optical system can sometimes play a little bit of tricks on them and they'll take some sill, uh, where they really don't need it. Um, if you really do truly, you know, get three lines improvement with a buck 50 of sill and you really believe that they have sill and they have a really irregular cornea, so it makes sense that they would have some residual sill. Um, my advice is to put at least a toric. Most of these fitting sets are going to have a toric option there. Put a toric toric landing zone on um, so that you can try to use a toric so that you can help stabilize the rotation. Um, Again, I, I won't go too much into this more advanced. Work with your consultants to figure this out. If you absolutely don't want a toric landing zone, um, you can do a prism ballast, but it's it's a lot of times uh, easier and, and the patient ends up being more comfortable if you do use, use a toric. So for actual lens ordering, so you'll give them diameter. Oftentimes you can just give the consultants the, the diagnostic lens you used and then your over refraction, make it easy on yourself and make sure they can do the math for you um, or you can do it too and, and check and see if you guys get the same thing. Um, you'll give them a sag and or a base curve value and then again, intermediate transition limbal zone, steepen it, flatten it, however you like. Um, and then that landing zone. So some of these custom edges you can see on the side here, here's a pretty good pinguecula. So this is actually a, oops, sorry. This is a truncated lens here. Um, here's some lenses that have little vaults and little areas that they that are customized to, to vault over just certain uh, anatomical irregularities. So work with your consultants if you have patients with some of these 
uh, conjunctival roadblocks, as we say, because um, you really have a lot of options for customization. And then power, again, we can do toric. Oftentimes, we can do multifocal uh, materials, colors. Um, we, we won't get into those, but there's lots of different options available. So back to our exam sequence. So next thing is going to be the dispense visit. Biggest, most important thing to remember at the dispense visit is dispense anything that is mediocre or better. If you have a even a two diopter over a fraction, just send the lenses home. Let the patients get started wearing them um, because you never know what's going to change when when they come back. Um, the biggest you know, mistake I see some of my colleagues make is, you know, patients come back six times and they haven't even taken a lens home yet. Um, so get the lenses in the patient's hands as soon as you can. Um, th these visits are going to be either very short or very long, depending on uh, their, their, uh, the patient's proficiency with application and removal. Um, so you have to kind of preempt them with this is going to take a while and then hopefully you get done a little bit sooner. Don't go too crazy with your sphere still over refraction. Um, and I don't generally order an over refraction at that first visit. I document it. I see what's going on a, a week later. Uh, and then I decide what what my uh, over refraction is going to be. And then at those follow up examinations, we do our subjective evaluation like any other lens. Um, looking at the fit, we can look at the tear exchange. I'll show you in just a minute. Uh, then we re remove the lenses, check the health, uh, and always follow up with patient education. Now, for tear exchange, and again, you know, there's there's a lot that we could talk about in terms of managing these. So I will just hit the highlights here. Um, tear exchange, I like to evaluate. Um, so I like to have my scleral patients come back for their first follow-up sometime in the afternoon, if possible. That way the lens has settled on the eye, and I know I'm looking at sort of the most settled lens experience or, or close to it. We can apply fluorescein near the edge of the lens. So this is a patient. They have a, you see a torque marker here, the lens here. So the lens is sitting furthest away from the conjunctiva and this meridian here. And you can see that's where fluorescein is starting to creep underneath the lens. And you can really get a good idea of what's going on with the tears, what's going on with the landing zone by, by doing this little trick, looking at tear exchange uh, and, and just looking at the, the fit. Once I remove the lenses, that's why I like to have my pentacam. We can take global pachymetry. I also like to take IOP right after lens removal. Um, of course, if you don't have baseline readings, that information isn't going to mean much to you. So keep that in mind. Um, but we can use this, and this is a difference map here. So this is a uh, before scleral lens wear, after scleral lens wear, and this is showing that we have about 35 microns of corneal swelling. Uh, you're going to get about 30 microns of swelling in most patients. Unless it goes above 50, I don't uh, lose any sleep over it. Here's what uh, some of the stuff that you might see if you have a, a patient with ocular surface disease who's got maybe sitting on the limbus a little. You can see this patient has a little bit of limbal edema. It's picking up fluorescein. They've got some redness in this area, some staining. We get this kind of red punctate staining. Um, so you want to make sure you take those lenses off, stain the cornea, see see what that tissue looks like. Look at the limbus. These are these are uh, impression rings. Um, we say, are they always bad? This one, probably not as bad as this one, which looks like it's causing some inflammation in those areas. If you're getting an impression ring that is severe, you can consider flattening those edges. Um, and again, there's other, other tricks you can use. But overall, you're going to have some compression of that soft tissue. So I usually tell people if that impression ring isn't causing any redness and it goes away, like if you have this when you take it off and it goes away in a few minutes, um, we're, we're okay. We're in good shape. But if you have irritation, redness, like something like you see on this right hand picture, uh, then we want to maybe for this patient use a toric lens. Um, there's lots of different tricks that you can do. Here's a good example of 
uh, what that landing zone will look like. This is a patient who was who was perfectly fine, not having any issues. Eye looks white and quiet. You take the lens off, you've got this little stain. So I say, is this okay? Well, the answer is it depends. Is the eye red? Is the patient uncomfortable? If they're not, uh, and you don't see and you don't see any negative sequelae, then then they can just keep on keep on rolling with those lenses. And finally here, uh, just our follow-up examination. So once we've finalized the fit, I generally will do a one month, uh, sometimes you've done a one month follow-up because you've seen them so many times changing lenses and, and doing follow-ups that I skip that and I just go right to the six month follow-up, but you can use your professional uh, guidance there. Um, so again, it's dependent on how many fit visits are required, but all of my patients uh, are followed every six to 12 months, depending on the severity of their disease and how uh, how well they do with the lenses. And just one last thought here, make sure we're keeping in mind uh, what the underlying conditions that these patients have are. So keratoconus patients, going to be susceptible to inflammation, atopy, eye rubbing, uh, post-transplant, you have to think about rejection, endothelial loss, are they on steroids, ocular surface disease is going to have a risk of infection. So always go back to your disease state and make sure um, that what, while managing the scleral lenses, we're also managing the underlying disease. And usually we're helping the disease, but we want to make sure that we um, you know, do no harm, as they say. So with that, I think I will, I, we may or may, I'm going to hand it over to Craig and he'll either bring it to Andy or we can maybe answer some questions. Okay, great. Um, Maria, thank you so much. That was just a phenomenal presentation. And I want to ask everybody to just hold on for a few minutes longer. We've got a couple of questions that we would like to ask of Dr. Walker. And then I'd like to introduce you to Andy Jackson for just a minute from uh, ABB Optical. Um, let's begin with, again, since this is a, a basic course tonight, somebody who signed in a little bit late uh, asked um, or stated that they had possibly missed it, but how do you determine which lens to start with? Oh, that's a great question. Um, and the re I probably skipped over that because really it's, it, this is the easiest to, to answer. And you're just going to, the most of the fitting sets will have a different metric for determining it. So either, um, you know, if you have an OCT and you want to measure the base and you want to measure the, the sagittal depth at a certain cord and match the other lens, um, or a lot of them will just say, take your SIM case and add a little or fit on K. But at the end of the day, we usually are just going to pick somewhere. And I usually find that I pick somewhere in the beginning of the set because a lot of the sets go really high and you don't need to usually go that high. Put a lens on and you're going to know which one to choose next. So when in doubt, um, just sort of pick from toward the beginning of the set and you will find I should have I meant to take a picture of some of my fitting sets, but they you, you'll wear down the label on one or two lenses because you'll learn quickly that most of your patients will be well fit with two or three of the diagnostic lenses. Great question. I'm sorry I didn't mention that. OK, no, no, I agree that it was great. Here's one other one related to design uh, that you did touch on uh, that may need additional explanation. And that is uh, what is the actual uh, terminology quadrant specific mean? Oh, yeah. So quadrant specific is if you think of the clock hours in the periphery of the lens. So say we're looking at a right eye. Uh, nasal is going to be zero, 90 degrees being superior, uh, 270 being uh, uh, temporal, and then 360, or sorry, 180 being temporal and 270 being inferior. Those are the four main kind of quadrants. So instead of a toric where you just have, you know, at the zero and 180, it's one curvature and at the 90 and 270 it's another curvature you actually have a separate curvature in each of those four quadrants so it just allows you to you know if you've got somebody with all sorts of conjunctival asymmetry and you literally want to even if you just want one quadrant to be different than three others you have the capacity to change it on that finite of a level Okay, that is great. So with that being said, I'm going to sign off uh, for this evening. Thanks again to uh, Dr. Maria Walker. Thank you to Andy Jackson. And thank you to ABB Optical for a terrific webinar. Good night, everybody.